Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Sophie Lieberman, and I'm the head of programs here at Sydney Living Museums. And I want to welcome you to the dining room, Changing Social Norms and Fashions, which is the second of eight talks um, that we are proudly presenting as part of the Sydney Open Talks Rooms in the House series. Um, as we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we meet today and pay our, my respects to um, their elders past and present. Last Thursday, we kicked off this series um, with a sort of general talk about the Australian House um, and Howard Tanner very kindly talked to us about the history of the evolving rooms in, in Australian houses and particularly how external factors like the availability of building materials um, impacted on the way that different rooms um, evolved and changed. And then Rebecca Huntley um, from the Ipsos um, group spoke to us about how um, Australians feel about their homes, having just finished a research report with Ipsos on exactly that topic. Um, and it was fascinating for many reasons, but tonight um, it throws up an interesting uh, point or conundrum, which is that Rebecca observed that the dining room in modern Australian houses is now the deserted room. It's the room that um, nobody uses, or if they do, they use it for storage. Um, because of the way um, that our rooms and our family lives um, have changed. This evening we're stepping um, quite a way back in time and we'll see um, the evolution of that process. And tonight you'll hear from Scott Hill and Judith O'Callaghan as they discuss both uh, that topic. Um, both Scott and Judith will speak for um, 30 minutes and we'll have time for questions at the end of that. Um, a quick reminder for those of you who are attending regularly next week, or those of, those of you who um, want to come along, this might be an enticement, we're opening up the Caroline Simpson Library from 5.15 to look at the special items in the collection um, around the um, bathroom, and you'll be able to examine pieces that aren't normally seen by the public. You do need to register for that, but it's free, and we would love to have you come along. It'll be a lovely presage to um, that session. And for other information on that, if you just check, up, uh, check out the SLM website or pick up um, one of the flyers on your way out this evening. So before I introduce tonight's um, speakers, just a couple of minutes of housekeeping. Um, if you could please switch your phones to silent. Um, we ask you to refrain from taking photographs or recording the event. Um, a recording of this evening's session will be available on the SLM website because you are being recorded. And of course, we'd love to hear your feedback and there are audience surveys in the bar as you are heading out. So please, if you have a couple of minutes, stop and tell us your thoughts. They do inform our programming decisions. In fact, this entire series um, is based on a conversation or a series of conversations that we had with people who attended last year's series about what they wanted to hear next. So to move on to the main act, Scott Hill is going to speak first this evening. He's the curator for Sydney Living Museum's Western Sydney and Maroogal portfolio. And his particular curatorial, in, curatorial interests are exhaustive. They include colonial domestic architecture and the villa typology, the relationship between architecture and landscape, and the interpretation of the ephemeral within house museums, particularly seasonal dining and floral decorations. And boy, is he in the right job. Um, the focus of Scott's PhD in architecture, re, um, the research is significant um, MacArthur family and their interest in architecture, which culminated in the building of Camden Park. Scott has worked on exhibitions with us at Sydney Living Museums. He was the stylist who worked with Robin Stacey for her house, Imagining the Past, through the collections of the Historic Houses Trust of New South Wales of 2011, and he co-curated a subsequent display at the Museum of Sydney. He is almost finished <laughs> being the curator um, for our forthcoming exhibition, which opens at the Museum of Sydney next week, and which you will find a flyer for on your seats. Eat Your History, a shared table, um, which is um, we urge you to come along to. And he's also recently been awarded, what was it for the blog? There we go. Best website for museums and galleries and shortlisted for the Premier's History Award. If you haven't already checked it out, I urge you to go online and have a look at the cook and the curator, if not least because today's post is about international talk like a pirate day. <laughs> so I welcome Scott up to the podium.
I don't know what people are talking about that don't use their dining rooms. This is us just last week. <laughs> we just had a few people round for a, a casual dinner. Um, if I walked into Elizabeth Bay House tomorrow and it was stripped bare, no carpets or curtains, no furniture or artworks, the walls painted white, I would still be able to tell you which was the dining room because its chimney piece is black. Today we may be oblivious to the more subtle coding of 19th century interiors, that cultural shorthand, if you will, of why particular colours were chosen or why, why furniture is arranged just so, but we can instantly recognise all the features of a dining room, know what its purpose was and basically how it was used. That's because the dining room, its standard furnishings and the way it is traditionally used, was to crystallise in the later Georgian and Victorian era, a time when the, diner, when the dinner was the most important and celebrated part of social entertaining. To jump back 2,000 years, this is not my house. Um, to jump back 2,000 years, and the Roman Triclinium was probably the last time that eating rooms were a standard dedicated space within a house. Three couches, either portable or fixed, provided space for the customary nine diners of a Roman dinner. Tables were placed at the centre. And a wealthy house could have several triclinia placed to exploit views, the seasons, daylight, or the scale of the function. For most of the next 1,200 years, however, rooms for eating were rarely fixed entities, but created as needs demanded. The medieval Great Hall, which served as hall, banqueting room, and bedroom, is the quintessential example. In the restoration period from the mid-1600s, rooms specified for dining reappear, although there were still basically rooms whose function could be quickly changed by rearranging or changing the furniture. It's a pattern also seen in the early colony. The original dining room at First Government House, for example, saw duty as eating room, office and reception room, and occasionally all three at once. In this circa uh, 1830 view, uh, the dining room doubles as a music room and busy daytime parlour. What you can't actually see is a fourth set of table legs uh, located just behind the seated woman, uh, because this is actually a dual table. In the mid to late Georgian period, the D end table, named for its two D-shaped components, was widespread. Its parts could easily be separated and stowed against walls and its component pieces transformed into side tables. A dining room could thus quickly become a room for dancing. A highly significant colonial example of a DN table is still seen at Rouse Hill today. It was, however, the shift from the DN table to the larger, substantially heavier extension table of red cedar, mahogany or oak that cemented the fixed purpose of the dining room. Once these large, heavy tables had claimed their territory, they were very rarely moved. Now, the planning of Rouse Hill House, which is a, a conventional Georgian symmetrical design, shows the relationship of the two principal rooms of the house, here facing each other across the back hall. Now, the dining room, which is this space up here, this is the front of the house, this is the dining room here, uh, it's actually quite awkward uh, because the rear window of the room makes the ideal central placement of a sideboard behind the head of the table, its traditional place, impossible. And so it's instead off to one side. And it's located in this spot just in here. Uh, the same issue is seen at Vaucluse's house where the creation of the dining room in the skillion footprint of the original cottage has led to a slightly sort of skewed arrangement with a large niche placed off to one side to frame the sideboard. By contrast, at Elizabeth Farm, in a room first built in 1793 but extensively made over in the late 1820s, absolute Georgian symmetry prevails. Now here you can see a sideboard, uh, a copy of an example from Belgeny Farm, the home farm of Camden Park, framed within a broad apsial niche, uh, serving or wine tables, then frame over here, then frame the central grey, dark grey chimney piece. At Elizabeth Bay, the symmetry is also paramount, uh, to the point where false external windows uh, are created to provide an outer balance whilst providing an unbroken interior expanse. And here you can see uh, the dining room at Elizabeth Bay with the dining room both set and cleared. It's a very large um, extension table. It keeps filling up. Um, you can see about 24 people on it when it's fully extended, just to give you an idea about the size. Although an optimum size for a dinner party in the 19th century is 14. And at the back of this wall here, basically where these two pictures are, 
if you go on the outside of the building, there's actually a window there, complete with glass and shutters. It's there to preserve the outer symmetry of the building. It's in the villa designs of the later 18th century and the early 19th century that we see the direct interlinking of rooms that characterizes villa design. And if we're looking at these two examples here, on the left, it's um, a recreation of a plan that only exists in palimpsest, so it's actually a rubbed out plan that, uh, that I've been able to recreate of a villa designed by Henry Kitchen for John MacArthur at Camden. It was never actually built. But you can see here the dining room space, drawing room, a breakfast room, and a library over here. And notice the way there's this interlinking of spaces. So you can actually do like a circuit in all the rooms. That's the real characteristic of villa design. And over on the right-hand side, uh, a design by the great British architect John Soane, uh, which may have actually influenced uh, Kitchen's design here. This is for a house called Tendring Hall. And quite fun over here, you notice the eating room. Dining room is not, uh, is in itself a relatively recent word. You find dining room, dining room, as it's sometimes called, but quite often just eating room uh, are the standard rooms, even right into the, the 19th century. But here you can see how the eating room flows through into the billiard room, drawing room, library. So you get this sequence of spaces. And here in a slightly blurry, sorry about that, uh, picture of Elizabeth Bay House, here you've got the dining room here at the front of the house, uh, flanking one side of the hall, and on the other side you've got the drawing room over here. Uh, and you can go from the hall, drawing room, library, saloon, breakfast room, dining room. So you've got this fantastic circuit of quite different spatial experiences as you go around that floor. Now, Camden Park. In John Verge's original design for Camden Park, we can actually see the direct link between drawing room and dining room maintained. In the design as built, however, the door that we see here in the original plan uh, has actually not been built. And in the original plan as well, someone's actually inked over that and then smudged it. There's a great smear of ink that runs across the dining room at that point. But this is how the, the building was actually originally designed. So you can see, again, a flow through between library, drawing room, and into dining room. So a sequence of spaces. Um, but that door was actually not built, and we see a different formation instead, because the route between the two rooms now incorporates a corridor. That's the space here, now known as the book, the book passage, because it's lined in, in bookcases, um, that puts some distance between the two principal rooms. Uh, and it's quite a processional way. So the, the way that these rooms have started to relate to each other is starting to change. In Edward Bloor's 1834 design for New Government House, for instance, an entire anteroom separates the dining and drawing rooms, both spatially and acoustically. So you've actually got now the beginnings of a more of an elaborate processional way uh, where couples who are moving to the dining room uh, will link arms and go through together. This separation would be the standard spatial arrangement for the rest of the century. And you even see it, for example, uh, in 1885 at Marugal down at Nara, albeit on a smaller scale. It also became the custom in larger houses to incorporate a breakfast room, and this doubled as an informal everyday dining room for the family, not solely for breakfast, although that's the purpose that gave the room its name. The formal dining room became just that, increasingly formal, showy, and quite often ponderous. It was the best room. Uh, this particular uh, print is provenance to Brownlow Hill, which is the Maclay's country property. And the details that you see here, because it's a remarkably detailed image, have actually inspired um, the presentation of the recreated breakfast room at Elizabeth Bay today. It's prints like these that really tell curators like myself so much about how these rooms actually appeared in this period. So if you look at the actual table setting here, when we set the room for breakfast, we actually model it on that image there. But things like the crumb cloth, great bit over here. You can see the tea caddy. It's still got the keys in there because the lady of the house is keeping the keys and locking it so the servants don't get the tea. Now, I started by saying that the dining room uh, at Elizabeth Bay was identifiable by its chimney piece, and this is actually not an exaggeration. This is the dining room at Rouse Hill, arranged for breakfast, uh, perhaps any time between 1890 and maybe the 1930s. Um, unlike their feminine counterparts, the drawing room, 19th century dining rooms were distinctly masculine spaces. Family portraits, sombre colours, these are the things that dominate in these rooms. Unlike the drawing room, which ideally had uh, a white or pale marble and very ornate chimney piece, and think only of the really elaborate example that you see in the drawing room at Vaucluse, for example, 
Uh, dining room chimney pieces were dark, ideally black, and preferably quite plain and somber. And you can really see it in this, in this dark gray marble example here. It's really quite a very sober, quite severe design. But the other elements of the dining room that you see here were now also fixed in the dining room repertoire. Apart from the portraits that you see around the room, and there's several more behind the camera as well, note the sideboard to the back right. Now this is a mid-century style of sideboard with the arched mirrored back uh, and a solid, front, solid bow front. Um, and the provision to the left of a convenient couch or chaise. It's over on the left of the picture. Um, here are two other examples that repeat that basic format. Um, a dining room at a house called Myrndal and the dining room at Camden Park. Um, in the Camden dining room, especially note the chairs, because when this room was created uh, in the very early 1830s and the, the furniture uh, made for the room, these chairs with their blank, undecorated backs were actually kept against the walls when not in use. So it's, it's a carryover of that late Georgian tradition Furniture being kept against walls and only brought out as required. Very different to the Victorian traditions. And two other elements, of course, that became fixtures of the dining room throughout the 19th century. On the left, the sideboard, um, this is the descendant of the buffet uh, that we find in the late medieval, the Elizabethan, the Tudor, right through the restoration periods. Um, these were designed for the display of plate, um, armorial wear, things like that. So these are quite splendid uh, displays. Um, they reduced and became far more practical items for use. Um, this is the pedestal sideboard, and you can see it's named that because it's got two pedestals to either side and the broad flat top. These are actually, that's a concealed drawer. It doesn't have handles to the front, but you put your hands underneath and you draw it out. Uh, same with the drawer there and a drawer there. And inside the two sides, on the right, you've actually got traditionally um, a drawer which pulls out for an sort of internal cellarette for bottles. Uh, that'll be zinc lined. In Britain, you might then fill it with crushed ice or snow. Uh, in the left, if you'd gone back perhaps to the mid-Georgian or late-Georgian period, you might also expect to find a chamber pot. Um, and underneath, you've got a cellaret, also called a wine sarcophagus, because it ref it's based on the shape of the classical Roman sarcophagus. Um, it's basically, it's a 19th century esky. It's designed for keeping bottles cool, lined in zinc, lined in marble, um, lined with lead, but designed to keep bottles cool when they're brought up from the cooler cellar um, and quite necessary in a hot climate like Australia. And on the right, um, that's a silent butler, uh, but also with serving tables or wine tables. These became increasingly necessary as more and more objects are being brought into the, um, into the dining room for display or for consumption later in a meal. Now, the tables of the affluent and fashion-conscious colonists were set just as their counterparts in England. And that's a term they used, by the way, to mean all of Britain. Not only in their choice of dinnerware, but in the arrangement and serving of food. A great source of information as to how tables were set and meals served in the 19th century are servants' guides. These how-to manuals were published from 1800 onwards, but by the 1840s and 50s, they provide a flood of advice to both servants and served alike. And Mrs. Beaton's eponymous guides really define this field. As a curator, I particularly like James Williams' The Footman's Guide, published in 1845. And curators like house museum curators like myself use this as a sort of a goldmine reference for recreating table settings, uh, like at Rouse Hill, Elizabeth Bay House, Vaucluse, Elizabeth Farm. Williams sets out to provide <clears throat> Plain instructions to the footman and butler for the proper arrangement and regular performance of their various duties in either large or small families, including the manner of setting out tables, sideboards, etc., in the most fashionable style, the art of waiting at table and superintending large and small breakfast, dinner, and supper parties, directions for cleaning and preserving plate, glass furniture, etc., etc. And here is William's design, uh, a page from his book, which is a diagram for a table layout for a first course. And this is a course set out in the style we refer to as à la française, uh, in the French manner. What this basically means, is if you look at this diagram on the right-hand side, you'll see it's a very ordered, very symmetrical arrangement. It's like a Georgian house. Everything is balanced and ordered. There's no asymmetry happening here. At the head of the table, because here you have the sideboard, at the head of the table you would have a roast, Currently down here, you actually have fish. And you can tell that because there's a fish slice 
sitting just down here. But you might also find at this end of the table, soup is being provided. So the soup is being served from this end by the lady of the house, and at the head, the master of the house is then doing the carving. And then arranged to answer each other, you have uh, savoury dishes, sweet dishes, because there was a blending of sweet and savoury dishes, uh, much like you would find in Cantonese food, for instance, uh, but also vegetables. So, and by answering, I mean that over here, uh, say here, for instance, you might have a vegetable dish. It answers a vegetable dish over here. You might have a sweet dish here. It answers a sweet dish over here. And then within dish, these courses as well, you might have what's called a remove. So <clears throat> say the soup is removed, it might then be replaced by fish, but that's within one single course. The second course continues this basic theme, but might go perhaps more from, say, boiled meats, more towards roast meats. And here's an example of a recreation of a, a very splendid à la Francaise setting. Uh, this is a recreation of Alexander Maclay, uh, the man who built Elizabeth Bay House, uh, his 80th birthday dinner, which was held at uh, the house of his daughter at Lake Innes in 1843. And it's using collection items from the Elizabeth Bay House collection. But you can see the idea of the soup here at this end, soup plates ready for serving out, a symmetrical arrangement, dishes here, answering dishes here, here, answering here, for instance. And the reason we have pink ribbons decorating the table is that pink was Alexander's electoral colour. Pink in this period actually being a very strong masculine colour, pink being derived from red. Now, an excellent description of a third à la Francaise course, the dessert, in the second half of the 1820s is given by one of my favourite diarists, uh, Prince Hermann von Puckler Muscar, who was a German aristocrat who was a particularly detailed observer of customs, architecture and landscapes. And this is his description of a dessert in the English manner. Now, admittedly, what he's describing are dinners in the absolute highest of houses. He is a German aristocrat. So when he says inferior, it could actually be referring to a substantially wealthy household, but the principles are basically the same. He says, at the conclusion of the second course comes a sort of intermediate dessert of cheese, butter, salad, raw celery and the like, after which ale, sometimes 30 or 40 years old, and so strong that when thrown on the fire blazes it like a spirit, is handed about. The tablecloth is then removed. Under it, at the best tables, is a finer upon which the dessert is set. At inferior ones, it is placed upon the bare, polished table. It consists of all sorts of hothouse fruits, which are here of the finest quality. Indian and native preserves, stomachic gingers, comfitures, and the like. Clean glasses are set before every guest, and with the dessert plates and knives and forks, small fringed napkins are laid. And by that, he means doilies. Now, did you note the line, the tablecloth is then removed? Oops. In inferior colonial houses, like Elizabeth Bay House, for the third course, the table was actually stripped down to the polished cedar or mahogany, then reset with knitted doilies on which were placed the new plates, cutlery, and serving dishes. Now, what I wish that Puklin Muscow had described at this point is what do the diners do, because I have yet to find an actual description of what happens at this point. Do they all stand and stretch their legs and stomachs? Is this why, for instance, you have a convenient chaise or sofa placed in the corner of your room? Do the servants perform an intricate series of acrobatic manoeuvres around them while they're seated? And I particularly like one servant's guide that advises in the setting of a table how to stand with your feet braced so as to remove the heavy opponent without tumbling face first onto the table. Now, here's a dessert course, again, from the footman's guide. And like the previous courses, the arrangement is still very ordered and symmetrical in the Francais style. And note particular, if you can see in here, see these? So like little, little scallop shells. So in the dessert, you've actually got a, this great range of sort of fanciful shapes starting to appear. And that's because 19th century dessertware was often in different, not just a plain round shape. They could be square, they could be lozenge, they could be clam shaped. Um, and they're also in bright colours, especially bright greens, and quite often they sport floral or landscape vignettes. And there's a particular um, service that came in with the Caroline Simpson collection to Elizabeth Bay House. It's a flight bar and bar dessert set. It's possibly my favourite piece in any of SLM collections, and one of the Campania urns is currently in the display case in the back office. So if you're here during the day, go and have a look at that. If it disappears one day, you'll know where it is. Um, now, if you're looking at these two recreations on the left, they're actually quite fun because in this example here on the left, you've got 
a recreation of a dessert taking place at Elizabeth Farm. So we're down to the bare wood. You can see the knitted doilies on which the, the plates are being placed. Um, here you have a nice square serving dish, nice bright silver cake, cake basket behind that. This is quite fun. This shape here at the front, it's one side of a, of a dish, and I'm going to get the pronunciation horribly wrong, but the Ru Yi um, plate, which is a Chinese motif. What these are all for, these are reproductions done by the members um, a few years ago of a provenance MacArthur dessertware, um, which was uh, bought in Canton, uh, now Guangzhou. On the right, you've then got uh, a recreation of a dessert at Vaucluse House, and this time also using provenance dessertware, so the, all these dishes, for instance, uh, provenance to the Wentworth family. And you can see the very typical kinds of things that a colonial dessert would feature. Uh, lovely flavoured jellies, particularly fresh fruits, and you can just see there the pineapple. Um, melons, especially uh, William Charles Wentworth, uh, had a particular fondness for melons, and the gardens at Vaucluse House uh, produced a wide range of melons, um, as well as peaches. Um, now, at Elizabeth Bay House, during its first decades, much of the dessert would already have been on the show throughout the meal, arranged in a very tantalising display on a side serving table like here. We know that the Maclay's dining room had two of these tables in addition to a large sideboard. Uh, and those that you see in the house today were, like Elizabeth Bay House, designed in the office of the architect builder John Verge. Uh, for the dining room of another great colonial house, Hannibal Hawkins MacArthur's Vineyard, now sadly lost, uh, in whose dining room Charles Darwin was once entertained at a lunch for 18. Now, the Francais style persisted, really, till the early 1900s in many houses. And here you've actually got some designs from Mrs. Beaton from really quite late in the 19th century. Here's a fantastic diagram of a supper table. And you can really get this idea of the dishes answering each other. The large rose tier, there would have been a soup at the far end, but dishes answering each other. And in this Francais style, it's what you call a social style. So if you're sitting here, for instance, you would assist the person here and here to these other dishes. So you actually serve yourself and your neighbours. It's a very social style of dining. Um, here's a Francais style um, setting from maybe the late 1880s, late 1890s, for instance, uh, again in the dining room at Rouse Hill House. Now, although service à la Francais persisted till the early 1900s, it was slowly being supplanted by a new and far more labour-intensive style, à la Russe. Named for the style popular in the Russian court and either brought to Paris by Napoleon chef or the French ambassador, depending on which history you read, service à la Russe in the Russian style was radically different. Individual dishes or pre-served plates were now brought to the diner by a servant with a selection ready served from dishes ideally located on the serving tables. Uh, it's a style closely related to silver service, uh, what the French term is service à l'anglais. And it, it completely changed the appearance of the table as you can see here. Um, you see, now we have ornamentation as opposed to the actual dishes of the meal. At first, elements of the dessert, uh, fruits, nuts, for instance, were used as display. Um, ornaments and flowers then quickly sprouted to fill the void left by the previous display of serving dishes. And boy, how did they sprout. Um, lamps, vases, statuary, flowers, and potted plants, including fruit trees or palm trees, all cavorted down the fashionable table. And there are just great descriptions of one of these uh, great diary entries of people going to a large formal dinner and not realising who's sitting opposite them of the, until some of the display is actually taken away. Um, whereas some people prefer to take the head shear approach and keep everything just below eye level. Uh, this is a particularly fabulous um, arrangement from 1914. And you can really see <clears throat> the way that the table is being completely occupied by very carefully created flower displays, folded napkins. And here's a very similar arrangement. Um, created, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at Rouse Hill. And if you actually go to visit the house today, this is currently the table setting that we have on display. For dessert, the cloth was no longer removed. And here in this example, you can actually see uh, finger bowls, for instance, placed on the table ready for use should they be required. Um, the complexity of table tableware required and extra cutlery also meant that as the century wore on, table etiquette became increasingly complex. Hence the, the great growth in etiquette books and advice books. 
But we cannot discuss the early Australian dining room without also discussing its iconic antithesis, dining out of doors. In her letters home, Elizabeth MacArthur wrote of her first years in the colony, of boating trips up and down the harbour, of tea parties on the islands, and to celebrate the return of their son Edward to the colony, um, a substantial picnic on, held on their waterside estate at Piemont. But while this suggests you know, the Austen-like preserve of the Regency gentry that we read in, you know, in the novels of Jane Austen, it was the everyday colonist that had actually embraced a life out of doors in the mild Antipodean climate. Along with the veranda, <clears throat> uh, the bush house, uh, which an Australian innovation for growing tender plants in doubled light, quickly became the setting for meals and festive occasions, and particularly Christmas. Its more refined relative, the summer house or gazebo, also served as entertaining space, as witnessed in Bessie Rouse's wisteria or magazine teas held in the summer house and under the wisteria arbours at Rouse Hill. But for the 19th century picnicker, dining al fresco certainly didn't mean rustic. In this view of a jolly Christmas by the shore at Manly, note the crisp and impressively clean white cloth on the right, complete with china and silverware. By the mid-century, uh, Sydney retailers, uh, the mid-19th century, Sydney retailers were already advertising ready-made baskets with ready-to-go picnic fare, especially boxes of drinks, which the men would provide while the women were charged with providing the foodstuffs. Now, I'd actually like to finish with the ad hoc 19th century dining room, the dining space created out of necessity. Now, at Rouse Hill, this was the arcade, uh, the roof space between the two rear service wings. Though this was actually a service, a stone-flagged service area, it saw concerts and theatricals, large dinners and wedding breakfasts far beyond the limits of the house's relatively small internal and formal dining room. It was in this space that the wedding of Nina Rouse to George Terry, for instance, was celebrated. And in this picture, we see the Hunter Club lunch in July 1895. Um, the Rouses and the Terrys were both great patrons of the Sydney Hunter Club. Uh, and in a great photograph of one of the meets that you see in the foyer, you can actually see Banjo Patterson standing quite squarely in the centre, holding his cigarette to one side so he's not igniting the hat of the lady in front of him. Um, so in this picture of July 1895, uh, you see much of the dining room furniture has actually been removed to the arcade, along with long side benches. Uh, the roof is then hung with banners and flags. And at centre, you may be able to make out, back in here, there it is, you may be able to make out the same upon that graced the Rouse's dining table and still does today. For the Victorian diner, impromptu need rarely mean informal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. And if you haven't visited all of those sites, I hope you'll want to after that. If you have, I hope you'll re-want to or want to again. Um, our next speaker is Dr Judith O'Callaghan, who's a senior lecturer in interior architecture for the Faculty of Built Environment at the University of New South Wales. Um, before she held that post, she was um, a senior curator of contemporary design at the Powerhouse Museum, and before that, the curator of decorative arts at the National Gallery of Victoria. Um, she's widely published and um, most recently published Designer Suburbs, Architects and Affordable Houses and spoke for us um, as part of Sydney Writers Festival um, in, this, in this room, yes, um, last May. Um, Judith's on the, the board of the Powerhouse. Um, she's had a long relationship with Sydney Living Museums um, and the Historic Houses Trust. She brings her students to our properties um, quite regularly and is in fact heading out to Rose Seidler in a couple of weeks with them um, as a way of introducing them to um, how they might work with heritage. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome Judith to talk about 20th century dining rooms. Thank you. Ah, oh, thanks very much, Sophie, and thanks, Scott. I was hungry before. I'm starving now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, where should we eat? Um, before I get to who posed that question back in 1954, I'd like to start with, I'd like to start with this image. 
Now this is the Cooper family enjoying some quality time together at their newly completed architect design home in Beverly Hills, um, California in 1960. Photographed of course by the very famous Julius Schulman. Now the Cooper family are not critical to this discussion, but what appealed to me about this image is that it encapsulates the dramatic shift um, from what Scott has been discussing in relation to the designing spaces and rituals of the 19th century and what came to be understood as the accepted norms of the 20th century, and which of course forms the basis of, of my discussion. But there's also a certain artificiality um, in the way this image has been constructed, that casual and relaxed but very carefully composed mealtime interaction. The image was meant for one of the popular magazines that Julius Shulman supplied, um, most likely House and Garden. As such, it serves to suggest the aspirations of the magazine's readership, but inherently, particularly Shulman works so closely with architects, it can be seen to represent the aspirations of the Coopers and of the architect responsible for the design of the house, William Beckett. The idealized image that Shulman has composed around this particular feature of the house must surely capture their view of how it should function. And that's something I need to be clear about at the beginning of, of the lecture. Um, I'll be discussing the idea of architects, designers, and design writers in relation to the dining room and the ways in which um, these ideas have been applied in the late 20th century and early 21st century. But I can't provide witness to the way in which these spaces were and are used on a daily basis. In fact, in my concluding discussion, I raise a question similar to Sophie's um, as to whether in view of the common everyday practices of today, um, does the dining room really become redundant? But back to the original question, where should we eat? Whoops. Now this is where it comes from, a book published by Melbourne architect Kenneth MacDonald in 1954 titled The New Australian Home, which as you can see by the cover, uh, provided advice on how to plan your new home and how to remodel your present one. In terms of dining rooms, MacDonald um, really didn't have that much to say apart from the following, which is where should we eat? The modern house in Australia is shrinking in size and the dining room as we know it some years ago has disappeared. The dining area has become an essential part of the living room. This means that life in the house is simplified. The living room can be bigger on the same budget and the dining table can be used for other purposes between meals. The point he makes about the shrinking Australian house is certainly true. Um, during the war years, government regulations had restricted the size of new houses to a maximum of um, 1,250 square feet, about 116 square meters, which is tiny. Although, although these restrictions were later lifted, post-war conditions, which included materials shortages and high labor costs, reinforced a conservative approach to house size even well into the 1950s. But of course, the idea of the dining area being an essential part of the living room, in other words, there being an open plan, had been around for a long time. Well, we saw it early <laughs> in the colonial period. But in terms of modern architecture, it had been around since long before the war, uh, readily explicit in the work of early modernists from Corbusier um, to Reitfeld. But now, Post-war conditions provided an excuse to apply such modernist principles to planning the Australian home. As Charles Pickett has noted, quote, the need to produce houses that were austere in size and construction gained modernism more converts more quickly than generations of architects and builders' advocacy could have done, unquote. And that extended to an acceptance of the open plan where living, dining, and sometimes even kitchens shared the same space. There's also a suggestion in, in McDonald's text that these living spaces and the furniture that occupied them needed to be flexible, to be able to be moved easily into different configurations and to serve a number of different purposes. So in other words, light forms that could also stand as isolated features within an open space. Again, nothing new, but certainly applicable to the limited space available in the post-war home. 
MacDonald provided illustrations of what he considered to be good examples of architects combining dining and living spaces. And two of the five illustrations provided, I'll get the hang of this, um, provided were of houses designed by Harry Seidler. And of course, you know, here the open plan, living kind of um, study, um, dining room, and beyond that, the kitchen. Here we can see almost a similar, you know, um, exact replication with living down here, um, dining here, and the kitchen server unit there. And also, of course, facing out into um, a beautiful view of the outdoors. Um, those exact interiors featured again that same year, 1954, in another book, this one published by Harry Seidler himself, that provided a catalogue of his own work to date, entitled Houses, Interiors and Projects. Seidler began that catalogue with his most famous residence, the Rose Seidler House, completed in 1950, which very obviously served to encapsulate the design philosophy and ideas that Seidler sought to articulate in the introductory section to the book. There he talks at some length about the planning and organisation of domestic space. This is one of the quotes. The informality of our most servant, mostly servantless housekeeping results in a basic zoning within the plan, living areas separated from sleeping quarters and usually arranged in an open manner. Seidler advocates what he calls the binuclear plan, which is an approach that um, Marcel Breuer, uh, one of Seidler's uh, teachers at Harvard, um, had promoted for some years. And uh, I've taken a liberty here of turning <laughs> this illustration, which is part of um, the introduction to Seidler's book, on its side, um, so that it marries up more easily there, a bit of cheating taking place. But essentially, it's dividing the house into two distinct areas, day or night time, public or private. Basically, it meant separating the living areas of the house from the sleeping and bathrooms, sleeping areas and bathrooms. And you can see it here applied. Here's the nighttime, and here is the daytime. And in between a kind of transition zone um, given over to children and hard-wearing surfaces. So, But also, I want you to note the configuration here, this progression of space of the, of the kitchen here, the dining room, the living room, because we're going to see that over and over again. Um, when it comes to the dining space, Seidler advocated a very close relationship to the kitchen work centre, and that also, that as in the living areas generally, the, design, the dining space should be open to the outdoors uh, via either fixed glass walls, which... Um, happens here, or ideally through um, glass sliding walls, as we saw in those previous um, images. So a definite connection could be established between the indoors and the outdoors. In terms of general decor, um, Seidler believed that an open plan demanded consistency in treatment, consistency in colours, lighting and certainly furniture. So there is not a dramatic difference between what's happening here and what's happening around the corner here. Um, loose furniture should be light to be easily moved for rearrangement or even storage. It was meant to be multifunctional. The chairs were meant to be able to be used in any other area of the, um, of the house. The table itself was extendable but also just as easily it could be um, picked up and moved to a storage space if entertainment needs um, demanded. Um, that sense of impermanence or of negotiated function is reinforced by the way in which the dining table in this image from the book is laid not with heavy um, linen tablecloth, but with, um, oops, sorry, oops. <laughs> Uh, rah, rah, rah. There we go. I think I've got it. There we go. I think you can quote, make out those little humble mats on the table there with um, tableware, simple but sculptural forms of Russell, Russell White, uh, right, sorry, 
um, and not just his uh, ceramic ware, but also um, his flatware. So quite an American theme, reinforced, of course, by the chairs around the table, which are, of course, the moulded plywood chairs, the very famous ones, originally designed by Charles and Ray Eames in 1946. Um, industrially produced, light, easy to move, adaptable to various uses, and in the case of the complementary range of folding tables, um, easily stored. And I wanted to um, segue for a moment um, in terms of how these um, items were actually used by Charles and Ray Eames in their own home. Um, and I think it's fairly telling how, how that occurs. Of course, their home was part of a very famous, um, highly influential, well-publicised um, case study house project of the late 1940s, <coughs> extending over into the 1950s. Theirs was case study house number eight, designed by Charles Eames, with some later input from, from Ray, his wife. Um, the Eames house and the way it's planned particularly and the way it's furnished clearly exemplifies the principle of um, flexibility. And you can see here, this is the dining area, which is like a corridor space between <laughs> the living area and the outside courtyard, which of course links with the studio and work um, areas in the other pavilion, two-story pavilion. So it's can I tell you, it's really hard to find any images of the dining room. And um, I persisted and found these, t they're actually tiny. This is terribly misleading because those images are about this big um, in the very famous book, Newhart, Newhart and um, Ray Eames, um, Eames Design of 1989. But it shows you there, that's the table setting here um, in this corridor space. Um, but it's funny, when you look at uh, images of the house, it's now you see it kind of there, but now you don't. So um, it's that principle of um, flexibility, or one might say impermanence, applied to the designing space, um, which this environment exemplifies and which could be um, seen in other uh, modern environments. Returning to Seidler, the configuration of the kitchen, dining, and um, dining, living, and outlook, which we see there. Kitchen, dining, living, and this outlook, very important to the whole experience, um, form basically the, the building blocks of the living zone that is repeated over and over again in modern homes of the period and beyond, as we'll see. Um, for example, in the famous award-winning um, house by Sidney Anker from 1945, here's this rather um, humble um, dining area located here in this plan, the open, you know, the living, the kitchen, um, dining placed around here. And in Robin Boyd's own house, the very famous house in Walsh Street, um, designed sometime later, 1958, um, here, this, don't go by, don't go by um, the annotations to this um, particular plan. It was the only one I could find. Um, but that's, in fact, the ground floor, and that's the first floor plan. But here on the ground floor, which you can see here, that's the first floor with the parents' bedroom above, um, it's the same configuration. Kitchen behind the stair coming out into the living and dining, which looks out into the central courtyard, which you can see there. Um, during the following decade of the 1960s, of course, the same formula is repeated, but with an even stronger emphasis on the physical, on the visual and physical connection with the outdoors. Here, for example, in the Rickard House, um, we see the creation of a discrete space on the northern terrace devoted to dining within that kind of, there we go, that's the northern terrace, it's through there. This is the um, dining living space, which is here from an angle. Um, this great emphasis on bringing the outdoors in, but also about expanding the concept of the living space to include um, the exterior space. Um, now, at the very end of the 1960s, 
um, interior designer and writer Babette Hayes and April Hersey, professional journalist and writer, published Australian Style. This handsome publication with photographs by Rodney Weirdland um, provided an overview of Australian domestic interiors of the period, but also profiled the people who produced them, such as designers Marion Hall Best, Babette Hayes herself, um, and architects like Harry Seidler and Ken Woolley. A whole section of Australian style was devoted to dining, based on the expressed belief that, quote, the dining room, that vanishing and reappearing symbol of affluence, is extant again in Australia, unquote. And it's interesting that they make that connection between affluence and the presence of the dining room, that it wasn't necessarily a matter of intelligent design and planning, but of having enough money to afford the space. Certainly living standards for a large percentage of the population in Australia, as in other Western countries, greatly improved over the period 1945 to 1970. By 1970, in fact, per capita consumption in Australia had, uh, was double what it had been in 1940. And there was a burgeoning of venues geared to cater to that new affluence, including restaurants in much greater variety than had ever been seen before. Australians began to dine out in unprecedented numbers, the experience and its special qualities um, becoming more generally um, accessible. It is that new way of thinking about the dining experience, as well as an increasingly sophisticated palette, that Hayes and Hersey cite as major contrib uh, contributors to the renewed status of for the, the domestic dining space. And I'll quote here, perhaps the devaluation of the boiled potato and all that it has stood for has had something to do with the reappearance of the dining room. The small dinner party is quite a new departure for the majority of Australians, but it is beginning to acquire an importance that demands all the accessories that help to create an intimate atmosphere. First and foremost is the room set apart for dining. One particular individual who can take responsibility for some of that new approach to cooking and eating is, of course, Margaret Fulton. Um, a force within um, Australian cooking and, um, and eating. Uh, for many years, the influential cookery editor for Women's Day, she also made guest appearances on television shows, she was one of the first um, in Australia to promote French cuisine in a popular way, you know, for the home cook. Um, and then that was in the 1950s. And then, of course, she advocated Italian, Spanish, Indian and Chinese. Um, and in 1968, she published her very famous uh, Margaret Fulton cookbook, which enjoyed instant success. Um, in 10 years, it reportedly had sold more than two-thirds of, two of a million copies, which was a record for cookbooks here. Um, and if you've got a copy of that, I'd hang on to it because <laughs> I think it's going to be worth a lot of money. <laughs> I wish I'd kept my mum's. Um, Hayes and Hersey also point to the new importance of wine to Australians. Wine cellars are commonplace, they say, and wine racks and cupboards are in every dining room. The beginning of this uh, boom in the Australian wine industry is usually associated with the 1970s. However, even by the 1950s, the wine industry was again um, beginning to thrive in Australia, with South Australia at its epicentre. New skills had been introduced by European migrants um, at the end of the Second World War, and in 1966, the first new wine varieties were allowed, vine, sorry, varieties were allowed into the country. Um, since the grand embargo of 1900, and they um, arrived in South Australia. There was now a shift in focus in wine production from fortified wines, of which we had excelled um, during the course of the century, to table wines, and the boom began. And I just had to include <laughs> the bag in the box, you know, <laughs> which had been um, invented in the 1950s. Um, I think by a German, and, um, but it was patented and released here um, in 1965 by Tom Angove of Angove Wines. So here we've got the famous Coolabar um, cask, of course. 
But as Hayes and um, Hersey point out, it wasn't just a developing taste for good food and good wine that contributed to the reappearance of the dining room in the 1960s. It was also the kinds of houses that the middle market were now making their homes. The refurbished, as they say, the refurbished and renovated terraced houses and old Victorian cottages, unquote. The 1960s, of course, you know, were, witnessed the um, beginning of the inner city gentrification with Paddington um, being a prime example. So in terms of representing the dining room, Australian style, uh, the book Australian style includes restored and rejuvenated environments such as that um, designed by Peter Muller, who you normally associate with um, very um, modern um, architecture um, and dining room in Neutral Bay, uh, rejuvenated uh, by Marion Hall Best. But um, these uh, images are alongside more modern spaces, such as those created by Gail English um, of Marion Hall Best and um, Graham Gunn down in Melbourne. In relation to these new spaces, Hayes and Hersey note that while the idea of a room for dining may have reappeared, it was generally in a scaled down version, much smaller in size with only the basic elements of furniture employed, table, chairs, and perhaps a narrow buffet or just a cantilevered shelf there for um, as supporting pieces. The authors also recognize the strong trend to eating outdoors in a semi-formal way. Um, so, you know, this stunning double-page um, spread of Marion Hall Bess courtyard, which led directly out from her living room. And, of course, this is the um, age of accessorising and bright colours. Marameco fabrics obviously being used for more than just tablecloths, but as tent covers. Um, heavy, bright pottery would appear, very colourful um, Spanish glasses. And, um, and tableware was not necessarily matched, but uh, meant to be a cheerful, eclectic mix of old and new. So just eight years later, in 1978, Babette Hayes, with April Hersey um, contributing, published an updated version of Australian style, this time called Design for Living in Australia. Now, I'm not going to go into the same detail about this publication, but its importance in the context of this discussion is firstly that it identifies trends that are current today, which we'll see in a moment, and secondly that it reflects, the book reflects, Hayes reflects um, quite um, insightfully on the evolution of spaces within the Australian home and recognises that beyond the dictates of design, the dining room can serve as a barometer of uh, social and economic trends by virtue of its inherent dispensability as a discrete space. By 1978, the long boom of the post-war period was over. There was instability and within the economy and a substantial tightening of the economy. And Hayes notes, quote, that the affluent lifestyle that everyone was enjoying in the 1960s and was so confident about in terms of its extension into the future proved fleeting. And although there are many Australian homes with formal dining rooms complete with glass dining tables or hand-hewn oak tables, there are far more where dining has been relegated to family rooms and kitchens, unquote. So not so different from today, in fact. Separate dining rooms may still exist, but they are either found in very expensive slash conservative houses or in restored or rejuvenated Victorian or, Victorian, um, uh, Victorian or Federation houses. And for most Australians um, these days, investing in new homes, um, in, for those investing new ho in new homes today, a separate discrete room for dining is really a thing of the past. Hayes all also notes, already notes in 1978 that, quote, informal dining eating almost always occurs in or at the kitchen. This all-purpose kitchen area spot, um, eating spot, whether it is a real table or a bench, or where breakfast is snatched um, after school snacks served, where most interaction within the household, in fact, occurs. 
And um, some of the illustrations, I'll, I'll just talk about the second main um, area that she identifies for eating in the house, which is the dining space within the living area. Um, or family room, where, quote, more mannered and structured meals occur, unquote. And we're already well acquainted with that particular open plan arrangement. Um, and here it's interesting to, I guess, you know, there are many. This is a beautifully illustrated um, publication. Um, and I just chose two um, interiors to focus on here. Um, the all-in-one living space of a Melbourne rejuvenated cottage, but you can see here the kitchen bench. It's a very casual environment. Kids are involved in this environment, um, but there's eating provided for at the bench, but also in a rather humble um, table with in close proximity to the kitchen and also to the open living space. Here a more sophisticated interpretation, a new house designed for um, Laurie Terry, um, in, um, in Terry Hills in the bin 1970s by Glenn Merkert. But again, it's this, you know, the kitchen bench, the dining area, living area over here. Um, and of course, this, um, this particular house has, uh, like the Rickard house, an outdoor area for um, dining, entertaining. Um, around in the 1940s and 50s, um, the open plan formula is, and here again in the 60s and 70s, um, it's equally present today, whether it be architect designed um, houses, renovated or new, or project homes at home world, from the modest three bedroom, two bathroom Prescott 25 Chateau, <laughs> to the massive, uh, <laughs> five-bedroom, um, three-bathroom uh, Merlot, uh, Merlot Elite, right next to the theatre, which, of course, I know you all have in your own homes. I certainly do. Um, so, but something else that Hayes reinforces from those initial observations made in Australian style, and which, again, um, have particular relevance for today is what she describes as a mania in some quarters for wine and food, um, qualified by the expression after nearly two centuries of general disinterest. Um, Hayes points to the high sales of cookery books and cooking equipment as exemplifying um, this trend. And a lot of the book of those books at the time published as an, were published as an extension of the various cooking shows that appeared on television and gained enormous popularity. Who can forget Graham Kerr, the galloping gourmet, hey, of the late 60s and 70s? He was a prime example. Skip ahead a few decades, and we have the phenomenon that is MasterChef. And when I was seeking an image for this, I had to actually go to an Indian site um, to secure this because apparently MasterChef's really big in India as well. What an amazing thing. It's all around the world. I thought it was just here. Um, According to Hayes, another directly related reason for Australians to be inventive and pleasing in their settings was, quote, their enthusiasm for ethnic cuisines, Lebanese, Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian and Indian. And again, the pop current popularity and proliferation of shows such as Food Safari, Island Feast, Spice Trip, Too Greedy Italian, Kwali Kwong's China, Destination Flavor Japan, which apparently starts tonight, if you get home in time, testifies to the enduring nature, nature of this enthusiasm. Yet what Babette Hayes could not anticipate in 1978 was a number of other appetites that have more recently developed and have had a dramatic impact on the way we dine. Firstly, the popularity of fast food and prepackaged dinners. In 2011, it was estimated that Australia would spend more than $37 billion on takeaway food that year, representing an increase of $4 billion over three years. The prime driver behind these food choices is meant to be convenience. With increasing demands on our time and the stresses of work, we can all admit to um, resorting to takeaway, or at best buying a prepared gourmet meal from the local deli for dinner. And of course, the scarcer time becomes, the more valuable it becomes. So what do we do? We multitask. 
which means that we are not only eating more prepared food, but we are eating it while simultaneously undertaking other activities. Watching television, for example, but also working or playing on the computer, listening to music and or checking smartphones, and all that could be happening at once, really. A British survey in 2010, for example, found that 78% of children regularly had their evening meal while watching television, and one in four regularly ate evening meals in their bedroom alone. Pretty sad <laughs> statistic. So you may well ask, where is the dining room in all this? Um, is it now largely redundant as a concept? Well, perhaps for some, but certainly, as we know, not for others. Because ultimately, it's not a space um, indicated on a plan that serves to represent the way in which we dine. Rather, it's the, so it's the social value we place on the preparation, consumption, on sharing of food with our partners, our families, our friends, that provides the shape form and detail of that experience. So I say long live the dining space. Thank you. I'm faint. <laughs> August talking about dining rooms is making me hungry. Um, thank you so much, Judith. Um, we have time for some questions. Um, we are recording this, and so that the people at home can hear this and the people who come afterwards, if you could just look to either Claire or Terry and ask your question into a microphone, uh, we would be most grateful. Thank you. So, any questions? All right. Well, whilst you're thinking, I'm going to ask one, partly because that's my job, but also partly because I want to know. Um, you both sort of talked about the dining room as a very kind of almost performative space for a while and then it then it changed the, the performance changes depending on who's looking um, but it's sort of an idealization of, of of that performance as well would you call the dining room an aspirational room do you think look it certainly was in the 19th century um, it's not uncommon to when you're reading books like Beaton, for instance, she'll explain how you can afford a big dinner. And the costs of a dinner when you're trying to impress people would be extraordinary. There were um, shops that specialised in hiring out silverware and crystal, for instance, so that you could put on the show. But then Beaton will do things like explaining how for the rest of the week you can use all the leftovers. <laughs> um, so, yes, dining in the 19th century was completely aspirational. It, it was demonstrative. It was about putting on a show. It was about the display. And for all the, you know, the especially the middle class, it was that whole aspirational, I can do this, look what I can do. So oh, definitely, yeah. Hmm. Judith? It's a different kind of display. I mean, when they took the, the dining room out of the Eames house, it was almost, we don't need this anymore. Or That's right. It could be negotiated away. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think um, certainly these days it is aspirational because it's not much else. <laughs> but um, frequently it is just that room um, that, as you said at the beginning, is, is not used but is there. Um, whether it's used for storage, I, I don't think so. I think it's more that it's there and it needs to be there as mm. a statement um, with the potential for being used for social um, interaction. So, yeah, aspirational in that context. Mm. Any questions from the floor? If you, Claire, if you could just come down here. Thank you. In the 1800s, um, where servants would have prepared the dining room table for eating, uh, would that have caused a problem uh, because the kitchen was quite detached from the rest of the room due to fire risk? It's, uh, the, so the iconic form of the Australian house certainly had a detached kitchen and if, if the space permitted, that was certainly desirable. Um, in more urban houses, it's either enclosed within the main building or they do experiment for a while at the beginning of the century with putting it underground. Because one thing you find in the early um, 1800s is that houses drop. And that's particularly a feature of the, villa of the villa design. So think of those grand Georgian houses with a great sort of staircase that goes up the front. 
So you've then got your rustic floor at ground level, and that's where your kitchens and, and service quarters are. Jump forward to villa design, and because you want to have an immediate relationship between your main floor and the outside, your house actually drops down, and that's when you get your French doors. So the poor servants for a while are sort of underground. And if you look at Elizabeth Bay House, that house is actually designed with an underground series of kitchens, and it was built with them, and I'd say within milliseconds they realised, oops, well, this isn't going to work. So the whole rear kitchen range gets built as well. And it was originally joined to the house by a breezeway. So there was about a 10 metre scuttle between the kitchen and the back door of the house into the butler's pantry to get things ready, then whoosh across the house into there. So yes, food is arriving cold a lot of the time. That's actually part of the benefit of dining à la Française, though, because if your dishes are coming in covered and the food is en masse in a larger plate, it's going to keep its heat a bit more. Um, look, it, it really depended on circumstances and on, on how far the kitchen was away. Yes, in, in the big kitchens, that was the case. This is also when you find the servery is appearing as well. I mean, houses like Camden have servery hatches so that you can pop things through the wall discreetly and the, the table staff can grab them rather than come all the way around the corner and, and running in again. So it also decreases that kind of disruption. Um, so to answer, look, it could be an issue um, and that distance involved in some cases could be quite extreme and that was the, the perennial issue with, with cold food. Yes, yes, down here, thank you. Terry? Um, thank you very much, um, Scott and Judith. Your talks were just fantastic, really, really interesting. And I, I also really loved the way that they, uh, they kind of dovetailed together in such different and distinct periods, but there were some really nice resonances there. Just a couple of things that sort of um, struck me. It was so interesting as being uh, this idea about the the, um, the history of, of the dining room as being masculine, as being this masculine space, and then the, the drawing room being feminine. I think that's that's really interesting. It um, would be really nice to hear a little bit more about that. But also thinking in terms of with, with the, the things that Judith was talking about, that um, the way in which the, the dining room sort of got dissolved into the living room kitchen is it, one would think it's also got to do with the change of labour. I mean, you don't have the servants who are doing the cooking and bringing the food who, to the woman of the house who's uh, sitting there, and it was, it was the, has been the woman of the house who's been doing the cooking for most of this time, being the domestic goddess, and she wants to be involved in, in the sociability of the, of the whole dining experience. So perhaps you could... Uh, I might be completely wrong here and just making that up. I don't know, but maybe you could also talk about uh, how there's that sort of the change in labour and also the, the sort of the different genders with this whole social experience within that architecture. It's uh, really interesting, I think. Well, to jump back to the idea of the sort of gendering of those spaces, um, you see it uh, particularly in the, the furnishings. If you compare, say, your standard drawing room, it will be soft, luxurious, heavily padded furniture. Um, the paintings will be conversation pieces or landscapes or floral works, things like that. Um, as opposed to your traditional dining room, which is, even in those sort of quite late ones that we were looking at, sort of, you know, 1915, for instance, there's still darker colouring, predominating maybe geometric carpets, lots of wood, um, and they're not overly luxurious looking. Um, it, it really comes from the Georgian period when you start to see um, the houses become extremely symmetrical and also that period when the display that you start to find in various rooms starts to divide as well. So um, the idea of the salon as well becoming a very sort of feminine space and, and it's also expressed in the English custom which completely bewildered the French um, where the ladies would withdraw and this is also where this idea of gendered spaces really comes from, because drawing room is actually an abbreviation of withdrawing room. It's the room that you withdraw to. So the ladies, when they withdrew from dinner and went to the other room, would be met by the men later. Um, when withdrawing as a custom first starts, you might wait an hour or two hours for the rest of the group to meet you. But this is also at a period when the main meal of the day is much earlier. So it's not as though you're being met at you know, one or two in the morning. Um, and so those spaces become very feminine because they're being used by the ladies for a lot longer period. Um, there's some great cartoons that you see also, satirical works that you see in the 
late 17s and early 1800s. Um, things like uh, before the, the gentlemen arrived, the women are all like this. So they're all, all passing out, and then when the gentlemen arrive, they're all animated, and bright, and bubbly. Um, but it could actually, by all accounts, be deathly boring because the, the conversation has split completely for for some time. By 1900, though, withdrawing, it might be 15 minutes, it might be 20 minutes. It's actually quite a short time, not the, the great long time that you found earlier on. In terms of um, in terms of the kitchen, the relationship. Oh, sorry, but it's interesting to see the way um, Seidler talks about um, the reasoning for it and that um, the kitchen is seen to be the work centre of the house. But that's kind of qualified by um, a, a suggestion that, you know, that work is greatly reduced by the virtue of the introduction of new appliances and, you know, that make um, the housewife's um, toil so much lighter when in fact we know that that's quite a different situation, that there are certain imperatives associated with those labour-saving devices, um, that you use them, for example. So um, it, it is about, it, it is a relaxation in terms of making that connection between um, those areas of the house. Um, I do think that uh, during this post-war period, the, I'm sure it was happening earlier than this, but um, the dining space becomes very feminized and it is a woman's domain. And this is where, you know, I mean, that's why April Hersey and um, Babette Hayes are talking about the importance of accessorizing. This is where you can bring your creative um, worth to bear. Um, and this is where you give expression to that, um, both through the um, dining experience and, and the food that you're preparing creatively, um, you know, drawing on all sorts of different cuisines, but, but also the manner in which that's presented and um, the creativity of the table setting. Fantastic. Joy T, Terry, if you could just come down here. Uh, thank you, Judith. Um, just to add to that, um, I have the, um, the pleasure to live in a very early Harry Seidler house designed in 51, 52. But, um, and it, it, it's a very good example of the difference between architects as theoreticians and the practicality of women using kitchens because the kitchen was designed exactly like the examples we've seen with the, the bench, the sliding servery doors and the cupboard above the bench which gave enclosure to the working area. And the owner of the house, Mrs Tuck, from whom I bought the house and so got this first hand, um, wasn't having a bar of this because she didn't want to be cut off from the open plan living, dining area. So she just decided to never build the enclosing bench and uh, cupboards and servery and instead just built her own bench instead. So what you actually get is something that is designed quite deliberately with all this philosophy of being a modern, you know, environment. But she actually modernises it herself mm. way back in, in the 1950s. So um, it's very interesting to get, you know, the theory and then, you know, what actually people did to, to get, to hurry things along a bit. Mm. Well, it really does encapsulate as well the shift away from having staff who are behind the green baize door and all that sort of mess and nonsense happens out there then it magically appears at the table looking fabulous. Um, that it, it's now you who's doing it and you wouldn't want to be removed from your guests. So it's a very logical thing to actually happen. It's really worthwhile as well pointing out how much science, for want of a better word, goes into kitchen design at this period. Um, there's one uh, great example where they watched um, a woman in a kitchen cooking and they actually put her feet into white flour so they could actually watch on the ground 
where she was moving. And the idea was that the kitchen, the ideal kitchen for her, nothing was more than three steps away at any one time. So it's, it's a very sort of ergonomic approach um, as well to how these kitchens work. And that's as well what you see happening at this period. I actually had a question from the gentleman in the check shirt at the back. Claire, thank you. And then we'll come down here and that will be the close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk, both uh, Scott and Judith. Um, two questions. Um, first of all, um, Prof, due to the well increased mobilization of our lives and prevalence of takeout, and also increased like increased convenience of um, uh, kitchen appliances as well, could we say that it's probably um, around like the late twentieth century that? Um, dining hall that the dining room has changed quite dramatically and also I also would like I also wonder um, what would the dining room would be like in let's say like 2050 I can't go that far <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we also have to well I imagine what it might be like and that would be a fascinating um, project to be involved with um, but I think too we have to balance out this um, you know this these frightening statistics about um, how people are uh, are living and eating um, I think we have to remember too that there are an awful lot of people who still celebrate you know the act of dining and sharing food um, so it's, I, I think it's to do with social um, expectations and as I, as I said at the end of um, my talk, the social value that we place on the act of you know, preparing as well as consuming and sharing food. Um, and I think that that's going to shift and change. There are obviously great challenges to existing understandings about that. But, um, but it will modify. Um, there's, there's been no change to date, really, in the kinds of um, uh, dining um, configurations. Um, apart from, can I say, though, in apartment living, you, um, some of the smaller apartment blocks have very little in the way of dining space and even less in the way <laughs> of preparation area or you know, cooking area or storage area. So the assumption, that's based on the assumption that we will eat out. Um, or those pati the particular market for that kind of um, home will eat out. And certainly when you see, for instance, the first apartments being built in Australia around, say, the Elizabeth Bay area, um, after the breakup of the Elizabeth Bay house estate, you actually find in those that there are very, very few kitchens or dining areas that people are actually getting their food. You actually get take your plate, for instance, to very various cafes in that area, and you'd take home your plate at night ready-made. Um, or, as a lot of people who live in that area will actually describe, the cafes became their dining rooms. So your house became intensely private, and the way you lived and ate was actually elsewhere. And it was interesting actually hearing years ago, staying with some friends in New York, and we suggested at one point, oh, why don't we stay in tonight and just have people around for dinner? And they looked at me like we had, you know, suddenly sprouted horns or something. I said, you don't do that. People don't entertain at home. If you're going to eat together, you go out to a restaurant together. The house is a very private space instead. Um, but I think what needs to be stressed is that the role of food is hardwired into, I think, every society on the planet as um, it's what ultimately brings people together. It's, it's Food is a mediator. You meet across the table. What, it could be a metaphorical table, though. I mean. The idea of going out for coffee, for instance, the coffee is really just an excuse for getting out and socialising with someone, but it's having a food stuff with you. So whether that's actually happening in your dining room at home or in your lounge or somewhere else, the, the principle of what you're doing is, is still the same. It's just in a different form. But I think also the fact that so many ill effects are now being... Um, found to come from this unhealthy practice of prepared foods, of fast foods, of, of eating in front of the television or eating in the bedroom or whatever, that all of these um, practices are linked with obesity and ill health. Mm. So um, I think that has to have an impact as well on the way in which um, we think about how we consume. 
hence the rise of the home gym. Um, <laughs> Claire, we had one more question down the front here. There's two ladies. There we go. Um, I, I live in a, a house in Sydney built in uh, 1910. And it's a very, it's a modest house. It's a very common design. Uh, ours hasn't been renovated in as much as it was in 1910. And there's a bathroom in the dining room. And it's, it's a very common design, believe me. And I've always uh, assumed that this evolved out of a, a bathtub in front of the fire because originally the, this kitchen had a, a big fireplace. So I wonder if, you, if you've got any comment on that. I'm intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's the standard, standard layout of a house in the inner west in... Okay, so when, when you say that there's a bathroom in the dining room, is it elements of the bathroom? Is there... Well, it's... Um, oh, now I have to explain it. It's, it's the style of house where you, you have... It's a train kind of house where you have bedrooms in the front, then you have a li living room, then you have the bathroom and the pantry, mm -hmm. and then you have the kitchen. And it's a, a very strange way of laying out a house, but it's really common. Oh, it, it's basically how my... I live in a 1890s terrace, and that's basically how it was arranged, although we've done the Paddington makeover and torn off the back and put in glass doors. Um, well, well, I think we're alone in, in yeah. leaving it as, as it is. But our, ours was, was very much the same. It was the formal rooms at the front, then kitchen, scullery, um, sections going further back. Um, I'm not exactly sure, though, what you mean by there was parts of the bathroom in the dining area, or is, or is it well, a dining a, area that's... Well, it's a separate room, but yeah. it's a bathroom. Mm. Um, it could just be the but scale. The bathroom, bathroom on one side and the pantry on the other side. I, th then I think it's kitchen, just the scale of the, the house. The it, it sounds like it could just be the scale of, of the house, that it was just a piece of effective planning. Because mm. it was... Is it a one-storey building? Yeah. yeah. Very convenient, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Oh, well, something for us all to ponder. Um, what do you do when you have your bathroom next to your dining room? I, the suggestions are all inappropriate. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, thank our two speakers very much for really um, insightful and interesting, contrasting and complimentary talk. So please join me in thanking Judith and Scott. <laughs> and I thank you all also for coming out this evening. Um, it's Busy night in Sydney, um, lots and lots going on. Openings of Vikings over in um, the Australian National Maritime Museum, uh, Sydney Contemporary launching tonight. Um, next week we hope um, we'll be slightly quieter and you'll all come along to the talk on the bathroom. And um, please don't forget also to come along to the Caroline Simpson Library to look at those special items from the collection. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you.